I think I heard that you started to get interested in science in high school. Yes, uh, not really much before that. I wasn't much exposed to science. I didn't know scientists. And uh, I got to high school when I was 12, and, and I uh, just was avid about reading, and uh, mostly reading books about science. I remember the ones that really got me excited. There was uh, Aerosmith, the novel by Sinclair Lewis, which made science seem so romantic and rewarding and wonderful. And then there were the books by uh, Paul de Kroof, uh, Microbe Hunters and Hunger Fighters. I remember on my 15th birthday, uh, I was given a book called Outposts of Science. And every chapter was uh, described the leading edge of what was then going on in different fields of science. That was uh, what got me really excited about the possibility of doing that kind of work. And then I was really encouraged by my teachers because uh, I went to an all-girls high school, a public high school in, in New York, and uh, I think uh, I was uh, encouraged in, in my love for science more than I would have been in a co-educational high school. Boys were supposed to be so much better at math and science than girls. and. Uh, my teachers really encouraged me very much to think of a, a career in science, and um, I, I guess I was beginning to think that way before I was finished with high school. When you were reading these books, what, what about it seemed romantic or like something that you would want to do? Well, first of all, the, the idea of spending your time digging into mysteries and finding answers to questions that were important and difficult to get at, uh, I thought that would be a wonderful way to spend your life. And uh, I guess also it just uh, it, it, it appealed to me as as a uh, as, as just a way to spend your time, you know, uh, asking important questions and trying to find the answers. It seemed like like great fun. I, I always thought that I would have done it for free. <laughs> it was so much fun, but I didn't tell my boss that. So you went to NYU. Yes, I did, and uh, had a little trouble deciding about my major because I was really um, pretty much interested in, in, in heading for science. But I also uh, was attracted by poetry and literature and had a, a rather hard time deciding when it, when it came to the point when I had to choose a major. And I, I did decide on biology. Uh, mainly because I thought one could do science on one's own. I mean, do literature on one's own, pretty much, but not science. And I thought that someday I might come back to uh, my, my love for poetry and literature. And actually I did. After I uh, retired from my active research in genetics, uh, I became an amateur scholar in uh, Victorian poetry. That's what I'm doing these days. Wow. So I managed to have a taste of both. When you decided to get a PhD, was that unusual for women at the yeah. time? Um, I don't think it was quite unusual for in biology, although I think in physics and chemistry it probably was more so. Uh, it, it was uh, unusual, but not extremely so. I didn't feel that I was doing something particularly uh, uh, special. Uh, and my parents had never made me feel that there was any direction I, I couldn't take because I was a girl, and I was grateful for that. I wanted to ask you about how you got to genetics originally. What was your first introduction? Oh my goodness, this is almost going to be a confession, <laughs> because it's, it's something I'm really not proud of in the long run. <laughs> but I'm still grateful that it led me to genetics. I guess it goes back to when I was an undergraduate at NYU, I had a good friend who uh, introduced me to uh, translations of some articles by a Russian plant breeder named Trofim Lysenko, uh, who was someone who uh, didn't believe that genes existed, thought they were a bourgeois invention, and uh, thought that all you needed to do was manipulate the environment and change the heredity. And Stalin thought he was great and sort of appointed him to be in charge of Russian agriculture and, and biology. 
And so for 25 years, he ruled Russian science, Russian biology anyway. And he, he also ruined Russian agriculture. But at any rate, I thought he sounded great when I read these papers as an undergraduate. And uh, I thought it was, uh, I mean, I looked at his data, they looked very impressive. And I thought maybe when I get to graduate school, I'd like to test his ideas. And so that really, I'm embarrassed to say, led me to decide to go into genetics for graduate work. And it didn't take more than a month, I would say, of a, a good course in genetics at Columbia to realize that Lysenko was a complete fraud and a charlatan and uh, to, you know, obviously denounce everything I had ever thought of in connection with, with doing his thing. So that didn't last long, but it's what led me into genetics, and I guess I have to be grateful. <laughs> I must say that I uh, told Professor Dubzhansky uh, why I decided to uh, ask him if I could work with him as his graduate student. And the reason was that he was a Russian, and he could read Lysenko's papers in the original. I didn't realize when I asked if I could be his graduate student that he was a world famous geneticist. I had no idea about that yet. But anyway, there was a party for his 50th birthday that all his graduate students came to, and we all made a little speech. And I used that occasion to confess to him why I wanted to be his graduate student. And I don't think he ever laughed as loud in his life as he did at that point. <laughs> It was a great birthday present. It was. <laughs> <laughs> of course, by that time, I had safely gotten my PhD, so I wasn't in any danger. <laughs> and you were saying one of the appeals of working in science is that you get to ask really big questions. How would you describe the big questions of your career? Well, when I started um, my graduate work in, in genetics, the big question was, what on earth is this gene? How can it do these amazing things that it does? And it was a complete mystery. That was the big question. That was the question that attracted me to genetics and that made me want to spend my life trying to get an answer or to get part of the answer. Because people didn't know DNA was the hereditary material, right? No, not until 1953. Well, actually, a little before that, but they didn't believe it until 1953. By that time, a lot was known about how genes are uh, transmitted and heredity and uh, some of the things that they, they control, but uh, nothing was known about the physical or chemical structure that was responsible for what the gene could do. And it seemed very inaccessible and very hard to get at. And, uh, and that was the, the question that was mostly on my mind, to find a way to work that would help to decide what the gene was like and what it was, how it could do what it was doing. Yeah, so when you started your graduate work, what was the, what was the conception? What was known about how information was passed on? Well, uh, a lot was known about the actual transmission because it had been already established that genes are located on chromosomes, which are contained in the nucleus of every cell. And on the chromosomes, we already knew by then, in the 30s, I think, it was established, or even before that, uh, that genes are located in a linear array on, on the chromosomes. And uh, we were able to uh, follow them as they're transmitted from generation to generation. And we were able to map them and show a gene that determines, for instance, eye color is located on chromosome number 10 and uh, in a particular place. So we knew a lot about that kind of detail, uh, but we still didn't know how genes determine eye color and how they control the development of a fertilized egg into a human being or a cat or a dog and, or a, an elephant. Uh, that process was mysterious. We knew that genes are involved in all of those processes, but how they worked was still unknown. So it's pretty amazing that we learned as much as we did in a few decades.
It really seems like a golden era of science. I think it was. I think I hit it at just the right time. Because uh, when I started my graduate work in 1941, they were just the beginnings of an appreciation of some of the molecular events that are behind the, what the gene was doing. Actually, in 1944, a paper was published uh, which really proved that the genes are made of DNA. But we had such a prejudice in genetics that genes had to be proteins. Proteins and DNA are components of chromosomes. So since genes are on chromosomes, we knew that probably either proteins or DNA were the stuff that genes were made of. But any geneticist I knew was betting on proteins. DNA was not uh, complicated enough to be the gene because the biochemists were telling us that it was just a single chain of four repeating elements. And that was not uh, complica complex enough to carry all the information in a, in a human being. So we were betting on proteins, which consisted of 20 units that could be put together in so many different ways that it had to be the gene. Uh, so in 44, when the paper came out, which really proved that DNA was the gene. I was in Cold Spring Harbor then and surrounded by geneticists I, I respected and some of them were very world famous and nobody believed that that was right. Although they, they didn't quarrel with the actual paper, but they found reasons to, uh, to disbelieve the conclusion. And it was not until in the early 50s uh, when uh, a more direct and definitive demonstration was made that uh, everyone be believed that, yes, it had to be DNA. And that's when the race began to find the structure of DNA. And that's when Watson and Crick, the two scientists who finally figured out how DNA works, that's when they really got to work uh, once everyone was convinced that it had to be DNA. And uh, it really was uh, incredible to live through that because almost every week there was a new discovery that made one gasp because it was so sp exciting. And it was like being on a roller coaster ride. And uh, I'll never forget uh, one day uh, being at a meeting in Cold Spring Harbor when the first uh, demonstration of how the genetic code works how the letters in the DNA determine everything that happens. Watson, um, unexpectedly, he wasn't on the program. This was a meeting at Cold Spring Harbor in 1953. They hadn't yet published their results. And um, he was an extra person just put on the program at the last minute. And here he handed us this model of the DNA molecule. And it, just looking at it and hearing him talk, answered all the fundamental questions about how the gene works. It was, a, it was just a revelation. It was like a curtain being lifted. And you could just see how it worked. And that evening, I heard a performance of the Messiah. And I tell you, I had the same feeling of exultation that I had in listening to that talk about the genetic code. So I think that uh, that says something about the the uh, emotional reaction that one has to great events in science, and they're on a par with your reactions to great works of art. I mean, the, the questions that you guys were, th were thinking through in this, they're so fundamental. I mean, to just understanding life. I'm so yes, <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, the most mysterious thing about DNA or the gene uh, which was solved in an instant when we looked at the model that Watson and Crick handed around. That was like holding the secret of life in your hands. The mystery of that was how can this material copy itself exactly every time the cell divides? And not only that, it can change. And then it can copy the changes. Now, no chemical or physical system that we knew could do that. So actually, some physicists thought that there was a new physical principle involved in the gene, and that's why a number of physicists 
became biologists because they expected to find something very new in physics. Wow. It turned out not to be, uh, it was just ordinary biochemistry. But when you looked at that double helix, the model of it that Watson passed around when he gave his talk about it, uh, you could just look at it and see how it worked. It was obvious and simple, as the final explanations often are in science, basically very simple. Now, that was a high point that is hard to duplicate. But it was one after the other in the 50s and 60s. A lot of the work that I did uh, starting in the 40s was, uh, was done before we knew about DNA and before we knew uh, anything at the molecular level about how that happens. I was working with bacteria. And bacteria uh, had become a very good material to work with for genetics. Because uh, in 1943, while I was a graduate student, for the first time, it became clear that bacteria had genes like other organisms. Before that, the bacteri bacteriologists were telling us that bacteria just change with the environment. When it was established that they have regular genes and that they can be used for genetic experiments, that's when I decided that I wanted to work with bacteria. I was just beginning the research for my PhD. And I had planned to do it with the fruit fly, which was the standard organism in genetics and a wonderful little bug. And I was going to try to understand how um, radiation induces mutations in, in uh, fruit fly, Drosophila. When I read that paper uh, proving that bacteria have genes, I really got excited and thought that would be a wonderful material to work with. I mean, they multiply every 20 minutes, and you can hold a billion of them in a little test tube. And so just think how many generations you can work with in, in a very short time. So uh, that's when my advisor at Columbia, uh, Professor Dobzhansky, uh, saw how excited I was about this new development using bacteria for genetics. He suggested that I might want to do my PhD research with E. coli instead of Drosophila. And that's why he, he sent me to Cold Spring Harbor for the summer uh, to learn how to work with bacteria. Uh, Luria and Delbrook were the ones who had discovered that bacteria had genes, and they were going to be there at Cold Spring Harbor that summer. And uh, so I, I did go, and uh, uh, that was one of the uh, most fortunate events in my working life that, that I connected with Cold Spring Harbor. Because it turned out I actually stayed there for, for 11 years. And uh, well, I got my PhD at Columbia, but I came back to Cold Spring Harbor uh, after that first summer and stayed on for 10 years through that wonderful period when everything was happening. So it was a real gift to be able to be there. Amazing that it just, you know, that you happened to read that paper and that your advisor suggested it. Well, there's so much chance in the way things develop, of course. I, I didn't realize that that was going to be such a, a life changer, uh, but it was. And, and uh, going to Cold Spring Harbor, of course, was again. And your first interaction with E. coli was also... Yes, I had a kind of beginner's luck, I think. The very first experiment I did, I had no idea what I was doing. I, uh, the director at, at the laboratory at Cold Spring Harbor handed me a culture of E. coli, a test tube, and he pointed to an ultraviolet lamp and said, uh, go, do mu induce mutations. So I had to sort of uh, feel my way about how to work with these bugs. I watched other people and saw what, how they worked. And I started my very first experiment, and uh, the first thing I needed to do was to decide what dose of ultraviolet light to use, because there were no published, um, there was no published information about that. So I was stabbing in the dark at the first try. And in my first try, I uh, overdid the dose. I used doses much too high. And the next day, when I looked at my Petri dishes, I found that I had put a million bacteria on the surface of each of them, and the next day, nobody grew. There was nothing on any of the plates, except one Petri dish, 
had four colonies growing on it. So four bacteria out of the million that I had put on that Petri dish had somehow survived this very high dose. And it occurred to me that maybe those four were mutants resistant to radiation. Because in Cold Spring Harbor at that point, there were, was a lot of talk about resistance. Uh, Dr. Demeritz was working on resistance to penicillin, which had just been discovered. And there was resistance to this, that, and the other that people were working on. And so I thought, well, maybe they were, why did they survive just four bacteria out of millions? And I cultured them and tested them. And sure enough, they could withstand at least 100 times more radiation, both ultraviolet light and later we found also x-rays, than the parent strain. So um, th that was my first mutant. It was like my first baby. And it was exciting because it was the very beginning. It was the first experiment I had done. And uh, it actually turned out to be the subject of my PhD thesis. It was interesting enough to follow up in that way. And it sort of it feels like it comes back around, or at least a little bit. It does indeed. Uh, something like 30 years later, uh, it turned out to be a clue to a whole new area that I was just starting to work on. And it led me to understanding that ultraviolet light uh, does a lot more than just induce mutations. It uh, activates uh, what we, know, we now know uh, uh, to be 43 genes, at least 43 different genes in E. coli, that are quiet and silent when the cell is healthy, but are uh, suddenly activated and start uh, turning out their product uh, when the uh, DNA is damaged by radiation or some other agents. My first mutation sort of led me into perceiving that this was going on. And it was a discovery of what we call the SOS response in E. coli, which implies that it's a, a life-saving mechanism, which it is indeed. Because uh, the activities that are turned on by these uh, genes that are activated by the damage uh, promote the repair of the damage and the survival of the cell in a variety of different ways, and the survival of the population, actually. And I think that my experience in Cold Spring Harbor uh, was what sort of uh, softened me up to think in terms of repair. Because one of the people I met in Cold Spring Harbor was a scientist named Barbara McClintock, who won the Nobel Prize uh, in her 80s, I think, uh, for the amazing work she did in genetics. And uh, it was a pleasure to get to know her. And one of the things I remember best about being in Cold Spring Harbor was that many times that I spent in Barbara McClintock's laboratory looking over her shoulder and watching her work, when she was making her major discovery, when she found that genes actually can move from one location to another, this was very revolutionary. We always thought that the chromosome was very stable and genes stayed put, but she showed that they can jump and they can have important effects when they do. At any rate, one of the things that Barbara uh, was working on, and she talked about this at our, at our uh, meetings at Cold Spring Harbor, she was studying how chromosomes join together when they're broken. Because chromosomes can break uh, as a result of uh, various treatments. And when they do, she noticed that they come together very rapidly. The broken ends join. And uh, she was very puzzled about how that could work. But she, she did uh, make, make a point of saying that they could the broken ends could find each other over a long distance, very completely different parts of the nucleus. They would sort of aim at each other. It, was, it seemed to be a force that was bringing them together. And uh, since genes are on chromosomes, and uh, the chromosomes are being repaired when they're broken, it seemed to me that there must be some molecular kind of repair going on inside the chromosome that would involve repairing the genes.
So I think that exposure to the, uh, the way broken chromosomes are repaired uh, made me think in terms of repair when I was considering what was happening in irradiated bacteria. So if you were to describe what's happening inside of E. coli when, let's say that I'm an E. coli and I get blasted with some UV radiation, mm -hmm. what happens next? What happens is uh, before the DNA is damaged, let's say by radiation, uh, the DNA is quietly replicating itself, copying itself. And uh, when DNA is damaged uh, by ultraviolet light, for instance, which changes one of the elements of the DNA and stops the replication, the enzymes that are copying the DNA cannot get by that damaged spot. So the whole thing stops. How should I imagine it? Like a, like a break in the DNA? Or what is the damage? Is there a it's actually uh, a, a change in one of the basic units of the DNA. It's not a break. It's a, a, a lump of stuff that doesn't belong there, sitting there, and blocking the, uh, the copying process. And that's lethal if nothing happens, because uh, if the replication is stopped and there's nothing that can restart it, that's the end of that cell. Uh, but we learned later that E. coli and all cells, including human cells, have developed repair mechanisms that can, uh, in various ways, take care of that damage and get rid of it one way or another. There are a number of different ways to do it. And usually they work very efficiently and the damage just goes away and the replication continues. And that happens, uh, in, as I say, in a number of ways. For instance, if you shine visible light on the E. coli after it's been damaged by ultraviolet, uh, that will take care of getting rid of the damage. The visible light splits that lump that's sitting on the DNA and makes it go away. So that's an immediate repair. And then there's another repair mechanism that's called the cut and patch mechanism, actually excision repair which detects the uh, damaged spot, cuts one strand of the DNA on one side of the damage, cuts on the other side, and thereby removes a small piece of the DNA containing the damage. And that leaves a gap. See, DNA has two strands. So there's one strand that's still intact, and the other one has a piece taken out of it by this cut and patch mechanism. And then another enzyme comes along and fills in that patch using the information on the other strand to do it accurately. So that's another repair mechanism that acts very quickly and that takes care of most of the damage that happens. But sometimes there's a kind of damage that cannot be easily repaired by these mechanisms. And that's where the SOS response happens. So here you have damage sitting on the DNA which the, the visible light couldn't help and the cut and patch couldn't help for some reason. And then what happens is the stalled replication, the place where the replication has stopped, generates a signal that says SOS, basically. And then uh, a number of things happen. I can't really describe them in great detail. The two strands of DNA come apart into a sort of a bubble, and that's the signal for the SOS system is single-stranded DNA, which normally doesn't occur in the happily replicating DNA. But the single strands bubbling out cause another molecule to come and bind those single strands. And that sets off a sequence which leads to turning on 43 genes. And then, so, and then fixing it? Well, it doesn't actually fix the damage. The damage stays there. But a new enzyme, a new copying enzyme, comes along. That's one of the SOS genes uh, produces a copying enzyme that isn't stopped by the damage. It's called an error-prone enzyme. It makes mistakes, but it isn't stopped. It just puts in anything at random and then the replication can continue. Then excision repair can take out 
that uh, damage. Sloppier copier is the term that has been used for it. Are there advantages to slipping in a, a, a change here and there? Well, we think so, because the mutation rate is something that is actually uh, changeable. Uh, the mutation rate is usually very low in most organisms when everything is nice and quiet. But one of the things the SOS system does is increase the mutation rate temporarily. So you get a lot of mutations happening just for a short while. And you also get an increase in other ways of causing variation in the DNA. For instance, recombination becomes more active and you're producing new combinations of genes. And uh, what we, how we interpret this is that when a cell is in trouble, uh, there's an advantage to stepping up variation because something may turn up which is useful. And so it makes sense in evolution to think of mutation rate as something that can be increased under stress. And this was a great mystery, right? Like even dating back to Darwin, about how you would get these changes in the DNA, not from the environment, you know, not yes. just how you would get sort of new traits. Yeah, well, Darwin was very puzzled by that. He, he of course, observed that organisms vary slightly all the time in all kinds of characteristics. And he realized that that could be the, the starting point for natural selection to make choices of variations that adapt well and getting rid of the ones that don't. But he was very mystified about oh, how these vary, what they were, and how what we, they knew so little. Uh, they di didn't know about uh, the most elemental concept of the gene. And Darwin struggled with that, and he did try to uh, figure out ways to account for it. That was one of the the uh, things he never quite got right. But uh, I often think that he, he would have enjoyed sitting in the audience at Cold Spring Harbor and ha and having the the model of DNA passed around, <laughs> look at it and see what, what really works. It must be very satisfying to be part of this really a great tradition of science. It was a great joy to be part of the group that, that uh, was working on DNA repair. I mean, it was a small international group. They must have been probably, I'd say, 30 or 35 individual scientists and there was a group of students around them and so on who were trying to understand how the DNA changes and how it's repaired and, and uh, all of that. And being part of that group was one of the most joyful experiences I ever had in science because it was a group of people with a very common set of goals. And uh, I sometimes hear these days that there's a lot of competitiveness in science. It doesn't ring a bell with the way it was in my experience at all. We've shared our information, we shared our strains, we uh, cheered for each other when somebody made an important discovery. And it was a human experience that was extremely satisfying. And uh, when I look back on my work, that, that's a big part of, of why I'm glad I did science. And of course, you know, there were a lot of people involved that I, I haven't mentioned other people, but of course, the SOS response was a uh, a joint work. And this was a, a, a young man whose name was Miroslav Rodman. He was a uh, postdoctoral fellow at, at the time at Harvard. And uh, I had written a paper in which I suggested that ultraviolet light was inducing two different uh, consequences in a similar way that sounded as if they were being induced together. And uh, Radman, uh, a few years later, had linked to other ultraviolet effects and suggested that they were both induced by the same signal. And one of them was the same one that I had linked. So we, we both linked A, I had linked it to B, and he had linked it to C. And when we met, uh, I guess it was in 1972, he had just uh, described his end of this. And uh, so we met and we put together this uh, observation that 
I had linked two events that were caused by UV and said that they were induced together. And he had linked two others, and one of them was the common one. So there we had three different ultraviolet effects that we thought were induced in a common uh, way by a single s uh, signal. And that was really the beginning. And by the way, Radman was the one who introduced the term SOS. And it was used in the sense of the international distress signal. So in a way, our putting together our two separate pieces of this be began the SOS response to be appreciated. So I thought I'd mention that because it was a, a very, uh, very nice thing that we, we both felt very excited about. That he, he, we, we began to sense a big, broader uh, system. So I just wondered if there was, if people sort of took this in any kind of, this sort of basic science in any kind of clinical direction. I used to tell my graduate students that we were really doing cancer research when we were trying to understand mutation and really? how it works. Yes, because uh, geneticists knew very early on, or at least were convinced very early on, that cancer was a, a, a disease that starts with mutations. And if we understand how mutations are produced and how they're repaired and how they uh, can be manipulated, we're really dealing with a fundamental aspect of cancer research. And I think that is true, that cancer is very much a, a disease of mutations. And, uh, and the SOS response, the, the human equivalent, the DNA damage response, has relevance for cancer. You have to take it into account when you're asking how a mutation is handled in a cell. It sounds like when you were doing this research, you were hands-on. You did a lot of these. Very much so, yes. Uh, it's very different now. I, I, you know, these days, the head of an academic laboratory uh, may have a large group of graduate students and postdoctoral fellows, uh, as many as 20 in some of the labs I know at Princeton. and. Uh, they're, they all have different expertises, and they're all doing different things. And the, the professor in charge of the group does not do experiments, typically does not do experiments with his or her own hands. They're very busy writing grant proposals, writing papers, supervising the work of everybody in the group. And of course, they are the intellectual uh, stimulant for all the work that's going on, and they're on top of everything. But they're not doing experiments, typically. It's very rare that someone with a big group like that can be at the bench very much. And I find that I, I would not enjoy that kind of situation. I don't think I would have gone into uh, biology if that was the only way one could work. Mm. But because uh, I like just doing the experiments, thinking about them, and analyzing them myself and uh, feeling close to the, the creature I'm working with. And uh, I'm not sure that you can uh, have that feeling anymore. Mostly it was a Petri dish and a pipette. That was what I worked with. And I used mutants to do the biochemistry. If you wanted to understand a, a, a system, you tried to find a mutant that couldn't do it. For instance, I tried, I, isolated a number of mutants that couldn't do UV mutagenesis. They couldn't make mutations with ultraviolet light. And so trying to find out what's wrong with that mutant gives you clues about how the mutagenesis works. And uh, you can, it's a powerful way to work because this, the experiments is simple, but the thinking is pretty intricate. And uh, that's, a, that's a different kind of challenge from the way it can be when you're dealing with very complex equipment. It's also more of a struggle for funding than it used to be, which I think must be very distressing now. Because uh, when I started out, uh, my first grant lasted seven years with a seven-year renewal. And it was renewed right up until the time that I, it didn't last for seven years after that, and it went to three years and then, but at any rate, the same grant 
funded me until I retired in 1991. And uh, I now hear from my young friends how hard it is to obtain funding even for very good work. So that's a big change and I think a very sad one. And so much of it now seems to be too, to, re to relate to sort of a, um, like a tangible practical application right around the corner. Yes, the, the, uh, the saddest part of the current funding situation is that there is not the encouragement there needs to be for innovative thinking and risk taking, uh, which is the, uh, the core of progress in science. What would you say to young scientists trying to get going in the field? What, what advice would you give or what are the characteristics that allows people to make big breakthroughs, not just sort of... Well, I guess there's no formula for that. <laughs> Uh, it always takes a lot of hard work and it takes a lot of luck. And I think it takes an attitude of, uh, of openness to other people's work. But I think mentoring is, of course, very important. It was to me. Uh, people that I knew who were uh, so helpful and so inspiring uh, made a big difference. And I think that that that's that's needed. I mean, you need people to uh, encourage you and and keep you on track. Yeah, I think women in science will be really particularly inspired by your story, partly because you were it, from the outside anyway. It feels like you were able to sort of do it all. You had a family and got to work on it. Had you had important work? What? I mean, is that, do you think that's a mischaracterization, or...? No, it, it, uh, I was very fortunate in that regard. I, uh, I, I don't know, I, there were two people in my life that made a big difference, that made it really possible for me to, uh, to have small children and, and time for my work and to feel not, not, not in conflict about it. And that was to have the right husband and to have the right boss. <laughs> Uh, I must say that uh, my husband was extremely uh, helpful in all kinds of ways. And uh, when I say boss, I'm referring to the, the man who was the director of the Carnegie Institution of Washington uh, at the time that I was at Cold Spring Harbor. And the Department of Genetics at Cold Spring Harbor was, was one of the departments of the Carnegie Institution of Washington. And Vannevar Bush, who had been the director of the whole war effort in World War II for the federal government, uh, had become the president of the Carnegie Institution of Washington. So he was the, the big chief, uh, and he wasn't my immediate employer, but he was the, uh, the, uh, the chief. And he came around often and uh, knew what everybody was doing. And uh, when my first trial was on the way, I asked him if I could take a leave for a couple of months. And uh, I was amazed by his response because he, he told me that he thought it was really a, a terrible thing that women have a hard time having families and careers in science. And he said, as long as he's in charge of this institution, we're going to make it work. And how can we make it work for you? So this was an extraordinary attitude to encounter at that time. I still, it still would be unusual in the 21st century. And uh, so I asked him for a rather extended time away and f to come back part-time for a number of years. And he said, it's done. And that was the way it was. I was part-time, uh, not only the, the rest of the time I was at Cold Spring Harbor, but I was able to continue working part-time until my youngest child was out of high school. So I was able to get grants that paid my salary and uh, whatever else I needed. And uh, so I was extremely fortunate in this department. And I, I don't think it's something that is so easily come by even today. So I'm not typical in that regard. I, I had 
a number of very lucky things happen. But I think that uh, one of the things that I think made it work for me was my own attitude of uh, family first. I had decided really in the beginning that I was always going to, when I had to make choices about whether to go to a, a meeting or whether to, uh, to do anything particularly demanding in, in science, that I was always consider the effect on the family and give that a priority. And uh, for me, that was uh, very important. And I did, in fact, uh, not do a lot of things that would have been very good for my career because I didn't think it was a good idea for my children. It, I never regretted that I had that attitude, and I think that it made it much easier for me to make decisions. And In a way, I think it was a luxury of being a woman that I didn't care as much about my uh, status and salary level and all the, uh, the things that matter very much to a lot of people. And these days with the women's movement are supposed to matter to women too. But I didn't care about that. I really wanted to be able to just do my work. Are there other moments for you like the Watson Messiah moment? Well, yes. I mean, there were, I, I call them Eureka moments that you have, you know, it's, it's, and sometimes it's not a big thing. Sometimes it's just the feeling that I used to get when I came into the lab in the morning to open the incubator, when I had just done an important experiment the day before, and take out a Petri dish and lift the cover and see right away, did it work or didn't it? Now, those moments were so special, even if it wasn't you know, a world-shaking experiment. But it was something that mattered to me. And I used to stand outside that incubator and prolong the agony uh, and not lift that cover until I had, you know, really gone through the suspense of, of wondering, did it work or didn't it? And then that moment of seeing, yes, it worked. And that was special. And that happened a lot. You know, those were little eureka moments. But they happened all the time. And every once in a while, there was a bigger one, which of course was wonderful. It's really, that's really selling a life in science, that. Well, I mean, it was made of those moments of joy. It really was. And I can't imagine a happier choice of, of a way to work. You think about doing, now you're doing literature studies. Could you imagine have, if you had gone in that direction instead? Well, I guess, you know, there must be joy in any work that, that engages you, really. But uh, it's hard for me to imagine that as a lifetime of work. I mean, I'm having a lot of fun with it now. Uh, and uh, actually finding out something new here and there. I've sort of published in this new field. Really? Yes. Oh. And. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's nice to get back to. I love Victorian poetry and especially Robert Browning. And Robert Browning and Charles Darwin are my two favorite Victorians. And what I've been looking for is connections between them because they were contemporary, uh, almost exactly contemporary. They never met. And I'm not sure they would have liked each other much if they had, although Browning was a convinced Darwinian. He accepted. Uh, Darwinism. But uh, they knew a lot of people in common, and of course it was a small world in which the poets knew science and the scientists knew poetry. And uh, looking for connections between them has been very much a matter of, of, of fun. It feels like we've come so far since you started in this field of genetics. Like you just it, does it amaze you, too, what, what we've learned in the last... It does. I mean, when I look back, I can hardly pinch myself to believe what has gone on since I started. When I think of the questions I had when I was beginning my graduate work, and I look now at what we can say about what we know, and of course, recognizing that we still don't know a whole lot <laughs> of, of things that are still ahead of us. But it's been a, a, a fabulous period of progress in this particular field. And uh, 
I'm just very grateful to have been part of it. I can't think of anything else I'd rather have done.